Hi everyone, my name is Frank and uh, we'll be doing the RDS X-Series Advanced Training today. Uh, this is a more in-depth look uh, into the RDS uh, X-Series system and the follow-up from the RDS basic training. Okay, so the series of uh, uh, X-Series is eight keypads and partitions, up to a maximum of eight keypads and eight partitions that can be independently controlled. Um, it's a 64 zone, eight zones expandable to 64 fully programmable zones, end of line 3K3, supervised zones, and one dedicated panic zone. It's got five outputs, so you have five programmable onboard triggered out, uh, power triggered outputs, expandable to possible 57 outputs. Auto on, panel can be programmed to on daily, at a pre predetermined time or based on no movement. Non-volatile memory retains all programs and a thousand event log data in the event of total power failure. And then we have our RDS, two, uh, RDS, RDS Swift uh, 2 compatible uh, that allows you to do programming events up, up and downloadable using the RDS Windows based software. Okay, just note if you're using the RDS Swift 2 that you do need the hype modem to be able to connect to the, the, the units. Yeah, so just a quick run through on the hardware side of things. Up here. Okay, so we start off with the kickstart jumper, which is your jumper over here. Uh, when connecting to a battery without 16 volt AC connected, the X series alarm panel will not power up until the kickstart jumper has been shorted. This feature has been included so that if the battery voltage starts fluctuating and goes below 10.5 volts without AC, the panel switches off stopping the alarm from entering into undesirable states that could comp compromise integrity of the system. When AC is applied, the alarm will power up automatically. And then we have our default button, which is this button over here. To default the panel, physically remove power from the unit and hold, hold down the power button. I mean, the, the default button, my apologies. Replace power while still holding the button and wait until the panel status LED flashes and then release the button. And next you have your status LED, which is this little LED in the middle of the board. So that's a panel status LED, indicates the condition of the operating system off is not running, flashing once a second is normal operation, and flashing fast, alarm panel has a system fault. And then you have your serial outputs, which is this connector over here. The serial connector on the X-Series panel, version 210 and up, can communicate with any device that has the RDS serial protocol, protocol incorporated into it. Always note, that the red wire must be closest to your heatsink, which is at the top here. So the red wire must be on this pin and closest to your heatsink. Um, I see Robert is struggling with sound. Um, I'm sure, I hope everybody else can hear me. Robert, just maybe check, uh, just try leave and then come back in and just make sure you do join with audio. Okay, so go back uh, to go back to your serial outputs. As from version 2.5, the X series J1 is not required. However, in previous X series versions, it is used to set the serial mode to reporting or download via RDS Swift 2. 
uh, for panels that are from version two to uh, version 2.41, jumper one closed. Um, this enables the serial reporting, jumper one open uh, uh, to allow RDS Swift to connect. Okay, then we have our programmable outputs, which all sit on the right hand side, top right hand side of the board, as you can see over here. Five positively triggered outputs that can supply 80 milliamp of current. So by default, output one will pause if a panic or duress is triggered. Output two will uh, pulse, sorry, not pause, or pulse if a panic or a duress is triggered. Output two will pulse. If a burglary condition is triggered, output three will latch uh, on when the system is away armed. Output four will pulse if the fire condition is triggered and output five will pulse if medical condition is triggered. And lastly, we have our onboard expander connection, which is this guy over here which plugs into this connector over here. The number of zones for an X64 and X16 panel can be expanded via zone expanders. Zone 9 to 16 are added by the plug on board expander or plug in expander, if you want to call it that, uh, onto the PC, PCB. So like I said, plugs in here, this little device plugs in there, little screw over here, and you've got your zones 9 to 16 added onto your panel. So this is the keypad bus. So all devices connected to the bus should be connected in a daisy chain. That means one after the other uh, for the best results. Although the X series panel does not need to be at the beginning or the end of the daisy chain. All, series, all X series keypad bus devices must be powered from the X series panel unless an RDS 485 bus isolator is used. So, important, just a. So, just important to remember that when you're wiring, to wire it from one device to the other to the next, in other words, daisy chain format. Okay, so then we have our smart expanders. So the RDS X64, uh, eight zone smart expander module. The RDS X64, eight zone uh, smart expander module comes with four connectors, which connect to the RDS smart power supply module. This allows it to report back. Sorry, let me try that again. This, this allows it to report back to the X series panel in the case of mains failure, low battery, and fuse failure. So these connectors over here, the connectors labeled A, B, C, and COM, connect to the corresponding connectors with the same lab label on the monitoring power, monitor power supply. A is for mains failure monitoring, B is low battery monitoring, C is for fuse failure monitoring, and COM is for common. So uh, just a note there that zone 9 to 16 are reserved for the onboard plug-in expander and cannot be allocated to a wired bus expander zone, even if the onboard expander is not used. So like we said, zone, zone 16, uh, so 9 to 16 are reserved for your onboard plug-in expanders and cannot be allocated to the wire bus expander zones, even if the onboard expander is not in use. Okay, so to do with the LEDs, so we've got a little LED on the board here. So if the LED is on continuously, then there are no errors. However, if there are errors, it will start pulsing the error number. These error pulses will be separated by one second pause with the LED off. Okay, my printer is giving me a hard time here. 
Okay, so the pulse errors, one uh, with one flash will be low battery, two will be no activity on the X-series serial bus, three will be no, no X-series messages detected, four will be no messages for this peripheral detected on X-series, five is awaiting a temper change, uh, six is ex expander not yet registered to the X-series, and seven expander tempered violated. Okay, so we also have the RDS Smart Power Supply module. The RDS Smart Power Supply module allows you to add another power supply with a dedicated 750 milliamp auxiliary power output. It also allows a 500 milliamp battery charging without losing the ability to monitor for failures. The status, the status outputs connect to the RDS X64 8 zone smart expander module, which will report back to the X series alarm panel. The RDS smart power supply module is built in with a resettable fuse. To reset the fuse, just turn the RDS smart power supply module off for a few seconds and then turn it back on again. Okay, next we have our output expander. So the X-series output expander um, module, uh, the X-series, the X-series alarm panel supports two programmable output expander modules. Each output expander has eight programmable normally open relay outputs. The outputs are programmed by address, addresses and actions from a defined list of programmable output events. We will cover the pro, this will be covered in the programming section a little later. Output, uh, output expander ID1 corresponds with the output address 18 to 25, and output expander ID2 corresponds with the output address 26 to 33. So the RDS bus isolator, the RDS 485 bus isolator protects the X-series keypad bus from ground loop problems, as well as potential voltage strikes. RDS recommends the use of the, four, the RDS uh, RS 485 bus isolator when installing the X-series keypad bus expanders or receivers in a separate building or floor. It also allows any X-series keypad bus to be powered from a separate power supply. If you are needing more than 750 amp for the keypad bus devices, you must use a separate power supply with the RDS RS485 isolator. So wireless, uh, the, the wireless X-Wave, wireless integration, uh, the X-series panel supports both RDS X-Wave and RDS X-Wave 2 wireless zone expanders. X-Wave 2 is only supported for the X-Series panels version 2.7, XX or whatever, and higher. You can have an X-Wave and X-Wave 2 occupy the same zone range. However, you cannot learn an X-Wave X -wave detector to an X-Wave 2 expander and vice versa. Wireless zone expander bus connection. The X-series panel can support up to four X-wave wireless expanders, as well as four X-wave two wireless expanders, each of which are connected onto the RS-485 keypad bus. Each expander can support up to 16 wireless devices, and each expander must have its own ID in order to map the zone, in order to map the zone numbers. Wide expander dip switches. The dip switches is used to set the device ID on the X-series X-series bus. This is done in binary and same and this is done in binary, the same as was done for the wide expanders. The exception is that these expanders each cater for 16 zones and not eight like the wide, wide expander. So if you're wanting to set zone one to 16, that'll be dip switch one. Zone 17 to 30, 
32 will be dip switch two on. Zone 33 to 48 will be dip switch one and two on. And zone 49 to 64 will be dip switch three. So if you're wanting to, to default these units, if all dip switches are on during the power up, then the unit will default and delete all learned wireless detector serial numbers on the receiver. You will need to power down after default, set the appropriate ID and power up to resume normal operation. Okay, so the X-Wave LEDs, there are three LEDs on the X-Wave uh, board marked as priority, detector and mode. So the orange LED, and indicates whether it's connected to the X-series alarm panel. If the receiver notices X-series communication, then it will stay on. The, red, the, the RFRX to, is the red LED, indicates when the receiver receives a message from a, from a learned detector. And the mode, which is the green LED, indicates current operation errors so if the LED is on continuously, then there are no errors. If there are errors, it will start pulsing the error number. These error pulses will be separated by one second pause with the LED off. Okay, X-Wave 2 pulse errors. Why is receiver module not responding? So that's your, um, your, your, your one pulse. That's why this wireless receiver uh, module not responding. Two pulses is no activity on the x bus. Three pulses, no X-series message detected. Four, no messages for, for this peripheral detected from the X-series. Five is not used. Uh, six expander will not yet register on the X-series. And seven expander tamper violated. And lastly, eight unsupported dip the address configuration. Okay, so um, wireless X-Wave 2. So when a defaulted uh, X-Wave 2 hub is powered up, it will register a uni unique network ID, which we call NID. When a detector learns to the hub, it joins that network ID and will only talk to the hub, uh, reducing wireless traffic. When a detector is triggered, it will send a signal to the X-Wave hub. So it will, uh, sorry, let me try that again. When a detector is triggered, it will send a signal to the X-Wave 2 hub, and it will keep sending until it gets acknowledgement from the hub, ensuring the alarm gets the signal. The X-Wave 2 remote panic configuration to put dip switch six up to disable, and for three seconds, uh, and then press any panic button. So X-Wave, <laughs> sorry, X-Wave 2 remote panic configuration. So put dip switch six up to disable the three second any button panic. So on your, rem on your remotes, if you hold your button down for three seconds, it will automatically put, send a, a panic signal. And to disable that, you got to put dip switch six up and that will disable that panic button. My apologies, I'm fumbling my words there. Okay, X-Wave 2 LEDs. There are four LEDs on the X-Wave 2 uh, board marked, beacon, network, trouble, and alert. Uh, beacon will flash when the X-Wave 2 hub is transmitting information. Network indicates the bi-directional network information. The LED will be on in normal operations with no errors. Okay, trouble indicates troubles with the hub connected to the X-Series bus. The LED will be off if there are no troubles. If there are, are errors, it will start pulsing the error number, which I'll go through shortly. Uh, alert will flash when the X-Wave 2 hub receives a message. So the error pulses. Um, so the X-Wave 2 network pulse error numbers, so one pulse, is a, means it's in learn mode. Two is a remote panic. Three is detector low battery. Four is detector tamper. Five, supervision loss. 
six low signal strength and seven is signal jam. So the X-Wave 2 trouble pulse error numbers. So one is dead keypad bus, two not registered to keypad bus, three is registered but not receiving message, and four is invalid dip switch. Okay, X-Wave 2 IO module. The X-Wave 2 IO module is a, wire, is a wireless solution that has two inputs that will supersede the wired zones the module is taught to. And, and the next consecutive zone. The output will automatically be registered and an output number assigned to it depending on the zone that is associated with. Okay, LED, LED statuses. LED one will light up when, when powered up and change state when the beacon from the X-Wave 2 hub is received. I'm just going to show you a quick video here. All peripherals, such as a wireless receiver or outputs expander, are added via the key bus. A four-wire connection, two for power and two for data. These peripherals must be wired in a daisy chain that is from one device to the other and not all out of the control panel. The RS-485 bus isolator requires separate power on either side as well as D positive and D negative on each side. For example, the one side of the RS-485 isolator will connect to the panel's keypad bus for power and D positive and D negative while the other side of the RS-485 isolator is connected to the bus of an expander that is powered by a separate power supply. The status outputs on the smart power supply connect to a smart expander module, providing monitoring for AC fail and restore, low battery and fuse failure and restore. Use the smart power supply with the isolator and smart expander to increase the power to your system or to extend the range of your system without losing your ability to monitor the power supply. Okay, so just to touch on some basic programming again. So this, yeah, the, we're starting off with the star key. Just quickly get my, so a little star key, bottom left of the keyboard, uh, is used to confirm entry and save information. Hold the star until you have beep, enter the master user code and choose the menu options. So this is to get into to user programming. Uh, just hold, hold the stick, star key down until you get a beep and obviously you get into user programming in that, in that way. In dealing with options that you have zone selections, the LED keypad can only show 16 zones at a time. To access zones above 16, press the star key to page to the next 16 until the, the correct page with the zone is located. So your hash key, which is the one on the right bottom, is used to either clear, last pressed key, or to exit out of the menus. Your scroll keys, which is your panic and your medical up top here, which we call the scroll keys, which has got the little arrows pointing to the left and the right. Uh, your panic key, scroll key forward, uh, scrolls forward, and your medical will scroll you backwards. Reading a numerical value stored in a location via an LED keypad. When using an LED keypad, values will be displayed in a binary format. Every zone is given a value which needs to be added together to make the value in that location. So which we covered this, um, the LED keypad, we covered in the basic training as well as the, um, you know, the, 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 the X-Series basic training as well as the, the intro to uh, alarm panels.
Okay, so defaulting the system. Every system has a hardware default button. This is activated by powering, by removing the power from the system and powering up while holding the button down until the sta status LED flashes. If the option in location 35 is enabled, then the only way to default the system is via the installer code in location zero. Okay, note, if you enable this and forget the installer code, there is no way to recover it. You can then not make any changes to the panel or default it. So if you've disabled um, the default button in location 35, then, and you've forgotten your installer code, there's no ways of recovering from it and you will not be able to make any changes on that panel. Um, it will basically need to be scrapped and a new panel will need to be replaced. Okay, zone settings. Um, location 10 is your zone shutdown count. This option monitors the zones for the number of times it, it violates, only when the system is armed. Once a number of violations reach the number entered in this location, the zone is automatically bypassed. Okay. Um, each partition has an option to enable any zones belonging to, that, to the partition that were bypassed due to the options in location 221 and 228, depending on the partition. So location 11 is programmable zone loop response time. This is the time that the zone must be violated before the zone will register a violation. So your default there is 24 milliseconds. So to work out your response time, you take the values from one to 255, multiply them by a value of 0 0.012. So let's take an example of that. So a value of 66 times 0 0.1, 0 0.012 will equal 792 milliseconds. This is usually needs to be, this, this is usually needed when using a detector like a vibration, sense, vibration sensor, for example. Okay, so location 12, cross zone delay time. Zones can be set to trigger only after two sets of, of options have been fulfilled. These are time in location 12 and a number of violations in location 13. The number of violations must happen within a time set. If this does not happen, the system will reset both the counters. So just to take a note there that each zone must be enabled to be part of a cross zone group in location 101 to 164, depending on the zone number. So location 13 is your cross zone delay count. This is the number of times the zone must violate within the time set in location 12, which is the cross zone delay time mentioned above. So each zone must be enabled to be part of a cross zone group in location 101 to 164, depending on the zone number. And then we go to location 36, which is our zone uh, zone status verify time. This is, the, this is the time a zone is monitored for a restore. If a zone does not restore, the system will wait the time entered in the, this location after the siren timeout before sending another burglary, burglary event. So, the, so take note that that zone restore verify must be enabled in the partition's extra options indication 221 to 228, option eight, as well as zone status verify count in location 37 must be set to a value of one to 16. Sure, so location 37 is your zone status verify count. Uh, the number of times a burglary event will be sent if a zone does not restore once the sound times out. After, a number, after the number in this location is reached, the zone will ignore 
will be ignored until it restores. I'm just going to show you a bit of a video there. A cross sign is a very handy tool to use in harsher environments. It dictates that a zone or zones must be violated a certain number of times in a certain time frame before an alarm is triggered. Here we can see that the cross zone time is 30 seconds. And the cross zone count is three. You need to enable the cross zone settings per zone in location 101 to 164, depending on the zone. You can see that zone six is not triggering the alarm until it has been violated three times. So our next location is our locations 101 to 164, which is our zone settings. So one is equal to your temper. This option allows the monitoring of the device for any interference, even when the alarm is not active. It is required to have a double end of line resistor as shown on the screen. So in order to set your temper, you need to have your 4K7 and your 12K resistors wired as, as follows. Okay, two is your cross zone. This is when the device has to be triggered a predetermined number of times within a set time period before the alarm will be activated. Also known as a double knock. For example, if a zone must trigger twice within 20 seconds. Okay, then we have three, which is a shutdown zone. This option monitors the zone for violations. And if the set number of violations is reached whilst the alarm is on, the zone will be bypassed. There is an option to try and re-enable the zone when the alarm does its auto test, but only if the zone is violated. Under extra part, uh, partitions, options, location 221 to 228. So four is your silence, silent zone. This one, this will not set off the audible alarm, in other words, your siren, but will report an alarm activation, but only if the alarm has been configured to do so. So your five is your charm zone. This will cause the keypad to beat five times when violated in an unarmed state. This can also be done via your user menu. Okay, six is your zone bypassable. And this enables and disables the zone from being bypassed. The seven is your PGM always triggers. When enabled, this will set the, the zone PGM output, location 415 to 422, to always trigger when the zone is violated. So just another quick slide, just to show you um, an example. You guys can just read through the slide. Um, there's no music or anything talking. So if you can just read through it, give you a good idea how to wire this.
So we're looking at location 260, which is in our wireless settings. So sublocation one is to add wireless detector. So a good idea is not to, to place the batteries into um, multiple X-Wave 2 devices while learning. Um, only do one at a time and close the housing once complete. As if left open in the tamper state, each device will continuously send join requests. So don't put, don't just install your batteries all at once into X-Wave, X-Wave 2 devices, do them one at a time. And as you, as you've programmed them, put them, finish them, close them, and then that'll, that'll resolve a whole lot of issues when you're trying to add those wireless devices. Adding a wireless detector is done by entering location 260. Select star again to select add device or enter the zone number followed by the star key. Press enter to confirm the zone selection. So we will show you a little video at the end just describing uh, what's happening with the X-Wave. So just hang on there. I'll just go through the theory and then we'll show you a little practical example. Okay, so once, once you have um, entered to confirm the zone selection, you must now trigger a tamper on the detector for the X-Wave. For X-Wave 2, leave the device tampered or enter a serial number of that device. It's a little bit different between the X-Wave and the X-Wave 2, but um, yeah, just keep those in mind. When you trigger the tamper, the system will receive a notification and determine whether the detector has already been assigned to any of the other zones. If this is the case, you will be notified with three error beeps and the menu will keep waiting for a tamper from an unassigned detector. So incorrect or pre-allocated serial numbers will also result in three error beeps and a menu will keep waiting for a valid entry. Upon a valid serial number entry or tamper, press start to confirm the serial number is correct and your, your wireless detector will be added. Okay, so <laughs> sublocation two will be delete wireless detectors. So if you go into sublocation two, enter your star and enter, enter the delete sublocation. Enter the zone number or scroll to the zone that you're wanting to delete. Enter a star to delete the detector. Hash, hash key at any time will return you back to the submenu selection menu. Okay, sublocation three is your signal power of receiver. So this menu is only available on LCD keypads, just by the way. You will need to trigger the zone to get the signal power update. This is only used for X-Wave and does not give a true reflection on the X-Wave 2 device signal strengths. So just keep that in mind as well that it's actually more for the X-Wave than the X-Wave 2. So I'll give you an idea, but not, not really a, a good, good idea on the X-Wave 2. So you go to sublocation three, enter your star to enter the signal strength testing, enter or scroll to the zone to be tested, then you press your star key to select the zone, trigger the device and the display will show a signal strength on the first row. So sublocation four gives us our supervision monitoring. Supervision monitoring is the, monitor, is, supervision is the monitoring of wireless detectors to make sure they remain in communication with the system. In this application, you can choose the time that the alarm waits before raising a trouble condition. If it has not received a signal from the device, your options are sorry. Let me try to read that again for you. That did not make sense. I went into the next line before it was meant to be. <laughs> okay. In the, in this application, you can choose the time that the alarm waits before raising a trouble condition if it has not received a signal from the device. Okay, so our options here are if 
if it hasn't received a signal from, from a, a device, then our options are one, which is every three hours it'll do the test, and two, every 24 hours. When entering the sublocation, the first supervision time display is entered, is the enter time. Okay. Okay, so you, please take note that this is not used with the X-Wave 2 devices. Okay, sublocation five is for the X-Wave 2 zone properties. Certain compatible X-Wave 2 devices allow you to change the detector's properties from the panel. The following options can be set. One, device LED can be enabled. So this is a yes or no uh, enabled. So is yes or disabled is no. And the second one is to set the sensitivity pulse count. See the detector manual that is, you'll need to, you will need to have a look at the detector's manual that is allocated to the zone for options N for default and Y for the second option. Okay, I'm just gonna show a quick video on this. To add a wireless detector to a zone, you simply have to go to location 260 and select add device. Then choose your zone number. Now tamper the wireless detector you want to add and press star if the correct serial number code is presented. Adding a wireless device will disable the wired zone. Okay, so our partition options. So arm or no movement. Each partition can be set to automatically arm if no movement is detected within, within a certain period of time. There are three steps that need to be completed. Location 165, no, no movement, auto arm timeout. There is a sublocation for each of the eight partitions. This is the time the panel will wait before beginning to arm, once all movement has stopped. If movement is detected within this time, the system resets and waits for the movement to stop. Movement is seen as a change in the zone status. A constantly open zone is not seen as movement. Okay, so location 166, that is your no movement auto arm start time. There's a sublocation for each of the eight partitions. The time entered here is in a 24 hour format. So hour, hour, minute, minute and is when the system will start to monitor for no movements. Okay, location 167, that is no movement auto on stop time. There is a sublocation for each of the eight partitions once again. If movement, if movement has not stopped within this time, again, hour, hour, minute, minutes will be added, has been reached, the system stops monitoring for no movement. Okay. Medical alarm or no movement, each partition can be set to monitor for no movement. And if movement is not detected within a certain period of time, an alarm can be triggered to alert somebody of the situation. There are three steps that need to be completed for this. So location 168 is no movement, medical alarm, time out. Again, there are uh, there is a sublocation for each of the eight partitions. This is the time the panel will wait before triggering the alarm once all movement has stopped. If movement is detected within this time, the system resets and waits for all movement to stop again. So 169, no movement, medical alarm start time. There is a sublocation for each of the eight partitions. 
The time entered here is in a 24 hour format, hour, hour, minute, minute, and is when the system will start to monitor for movement to stop. Okay, location 170, no movement medical alarm stop time. Again, there, are, there is a sublocation for each of the eight partitions. Um, if movement has, has not stopped, when the time has been reached, the system stops monitoring for all movement. For no movement, sorry, not for all movement. So if movement has not, has not stopped when the time has been reached, the system stops monitoring for no movement. Okay, location 171 to 178. Days for mo no movement, auto arm, medical alarm. Or, Days for no movement, auto arm or medical alarm. Okay, these locations contain both no movement, auto arm, and no movement alarm days of the week. So this will be your arm days of the week. Will be one will be Monday, two Tuesday, up to uh, seven, which is obviously Sunday, and then eight is all off. Arm day. Um, on day disabled, basically. Okay, that's for your on days of the week, your medical alarm days of the week is um, nine to 15. So that's nine is Monday to 15 is Sunday and then 16 is all off. Yeah, next section is auto arm and disarm. So each partition can be set to automatically arm or disarm at a certain time or on a specific day. So location 180 is your auto arm. There's a sublocation for each of the eight partitions. Time that the partition must auto arm is entered in a 24 hour format. In other words, hour, hour, minute, minute. So location 181 and uh, so 181 to 188, that is day, the days to auto arm or disarm. Uh, just take a note there that these locations contain both auto arm and disarm days of the week. So for your auto arm days of the week is one to seven, which is Monday through to Sunday. So Monday, one being Monday, Tuesday being two, three being Wednesday, four Thursday, five Fridays, obviously six Saturday and seven Sunday, and then eight again is all off. So for auto disarm days of the week, that is your uh, nine will be Monday through to 15, which is Sunday, and then your 16 will be all off again. Location 189, which is your auto disarm. Again, there is a sublocation for each of the eight partitions. This option sets the time the partition must disarm automatically. This option must be enabled in the partition options in location 211 to 218. Plus the days to auto arm disarm in location 181 to 188 must also be set. Okay, so location 190, auto on delay. This location sets the delay period for the keypad buzz warning before the panel auto arms. At the completion of the auto on delay, the panel will arm. A valid user code entered during the delay period will cancel the auto arming. Okay, so location 221 to 228 is your extra partition options. These are more partition options that can be set. So one is your automatic re-enabling of a shutdown zone at the time of the dialer test. If a zone is disabled due to reaching the number of triggers in location 10 when armed, the alarm will try to re-enable these zones at auto test. Okay, bypassing of common zones. If zones are in more than one partition and the zones 
may need to be bypassed at some time. This option must be enabled in all of it is, um, must be enabled in all partitions it belongs to. So that's for bypassing a common zone. So uh, three is your delay before communications. This option will delay any communications for the time set in location 45, except for panic and duress signals. A keypad lockout. If a person enters the wrong code and um, if a person enters the wrong code, the number of times set in location 20, the keypad will stop responding to any key presses for the amount of time set in location 21. So five is disable silent keypad panic. This will stop the siren from sounding if a P key on the keypad is pressed and a panic is triggered. Okay, six, toot on successful communication. When closing reporting is enabled and this option is on, the sound will only toot once the system is armed and has communicated the arming to the security company successfully. Okay, four by two stay zone reporting. When enabled and the stay, stay is, sorry, when enabled, and stay closing is enabled, all bypass zones will be reported to the security company when using the 4x2 reporting. Okay, eight is the zone restore sends after uh, um, zone restore sends after time siren timeout. When enabled, a zone restore will only be sent once the siren times out period has been completed. Okay, communication settings. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Location 24, account code number of digits. The reporting account code can be increased from six digits from four digits. Okay, location 45, communication delay. This is the time the alarm will wait before reporting an event. It must be enabled under partition options in location 221 to 228. Location 46, reporting communication options. These options set up how the alarm system will communicate with the telephone system and how many numbers it will dial to report the events. So one is your, dial, uh, your tone dialing depending on the telephone system, will depend on, on the choice. Modern systems all use time. So modern system, modern, modern systems use tone. <laughs> Bit of a tongue twister there for me. So two is to join the telephone numbers. 24 digits can be entered into the telephone number location. If this is not enough, the two, Telephone numbers can be joined to form one 48-digit number. So that's option two to join the telephone numbers if you need longer, more than your 24 digits. So dual reporting. Dual reporting allows the system to report to two numbers every time an event happens. So four is your alternate reporting. So off. Uh, will alternate between the telephone numbers for the number to dial attempts and on will dial the first number until all dial attempts are exhausted. Then we'll try the second phone number for the number to, um, for the number of dial attempts. Yeah, just a note on that, the panel can be programmed to report to four different phone numbers. Uh, phone number one and two are grouped into module one, and phone numbers three and four are grouped into module two. This allows for dual and split reporting. Dual reporting is when the alarm will report to both the numbers to make sure the signal gets through to the control room. 
If there is a problem reporting on one of the numbers, it will try the second number and go back to the first number after it has successfully, if after it was successful with the second number. Split reporting is when certain events are programmed to report to certain groups of phone numbers, and each group can have two phone numbers for dual reporting. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but yeah, I'm sure you guys understand what, what that was all about. So location 47, number of dial attempts. If the alarm cannot report on the first attempt, this location tells the system how many times to try. The, def the default is six attempts and can be changed to a maximum of nine. If this is zero, the panel will not report at all. So again, if this is, this is zero, then the panel will not report at all on telephone number or serial. So quite important location 47, not to be on zero, as if it is on zero, that won't report your telephone number or on your serial device. So location 48 is your download options. So one is your fax defeat. The system monitors the line and if the phone rings twice and stops, then 10 seconds later rings again, the panel will answer before any other devices that may be on the line. Okay, two is your forced answer. Pressing and holding down the eight key for three seconds, this will force the alarm system to pick up a telephone number, a telephone line, sorry, not the number. So holding the eight key down for three seconds will force the alarm to pick up the telephone line. So three is auto pickup. By default, if the telephone line rings 15 times, the alarm will pick up the line. Location 49. Okay, the RDS X series alarm system can be up and downloadable with RDS Swift software over the standard phone line using the RDS modem. So like we mentioned before, um, with the RDS Swift 2 software, you can obviously connect up and download your configurations, but you need the RDS modem and you obviously need to have this auto pickup set. Okay, so location 56, time between dial attempts. If the alarm fails to report to the base station, it will wait this length of time before trying to dial out again. Okay, so keypad options and delays. So location 20 is your keypad lockout count. If a user code, if a user code is entered incorrectly, the number of times entered in this location, the keypad will lock up for the time entered into location 21. So just a note there, keypad lockout must be enabled under extra partition options. So location 221 to 228 and option four, depending on the partition the keypad belongs to. Yeah, so location 21 is your keypad lockout time. This is the time the keypad will not respond to any key presses except for the panic button. So location 22 is your keypad sleep delay. If the keypad is set in location 251 to 258, depending on the keypad's ID, to go into sleep mode. This location is how long after the, the last key press the keypad waits to switch off all its LEDs. Obviously, when you press the, press the button again, it will switch on those LEDs again, and then the timeline will start. Okay, location 241, keypad delay start zone. 
There is supplication for each of the eight keypads. The LED keypad can own, can <coughs> sorry, let me start that again. So location 241, that's for your, your keypad display start zone. There is a supplication for each of the eight keypads. The LED keypad, the LED keypad can only show 16 zones at a time. Therefore, on an LED keypad, you can set the keypad to start at any zone. This allows you to set the physical zone the LED keypad will display as zone one. For example, by setting the keypad to start at zone 20, zone one on the keypad will only represent the physical zone 20. Okay, location 242, <clears throat> your keypad zone. There is a sub-location for each of the eight keypads. On each keypad, there's a physical zone input, which can be mapped to any zone. The physical zone that the keypad zone is mapped to on the panel or on the expander will be switched off. For example, if you make keypads number three zone, zone number eight, then zone eight on the panel will no longer be in operation. But the zone on the keypad will display and report as zone eight. And you can also map a keypad zone to zone 33, even though you don't have an expander with zone 33 physically connected. Please remember that you still need to give the zone a zone type and place it into a partition for this to work. Okay, location 243 is view keypad ID. To view keypad ID, enter this location from the physical keypad that you want to know the ID. So that's just to, to view the keypad ID if you need to know it for, for whichever reason. Okay. This is only for viewing the keypad ID. The keypad ID is set when you enroll the keypad and cannot be changed in this location. Okay, global settings. We'll start off with location nine, which is your RDS smart power supply module trouble display. When the monitored power supply detects any of your trouble conditions that are enabled in the table below, the power light on the keypad flashes, and if set in location 14, option two will beep. To view the trouble conditions, press and hold seven key down until it beeps. Okay, so location nine, which is a yes for enable or no for disable. Your sublocations are one, in sublocation one, so you can enable or disable each one of these. Um, AC fail on a smart power supply. This trouble condition monitors the AC power. The smart power, um, sorry. The trouble conditions monitor the AC that powers the smart power supply and will register a trouble condition after the time programmed in location 15. This will only clear when the AC is restored. So location nine sub two is your low battery on your smart power supply. The smart power supply tests the battery every 30 minutes. If a trouble is encountered, a condition will be shown. So sub location nine, uh, location nine sub three, a uh, fuse fail on smart power supply, a trouble condition will be displayed when the fuse on the smart power supply goes down. Again, all of these you can enable and disable. So in location 15, AC fail restore reporting. This is the time the system waits before reporting that electricity has been disconnected. So location 16 is your trouble display. 
When the alarm system detects any of the trouble conditions that are enabled in the table below, the power light on the keypad flashes and can be set in location 14, option two, to beep. To view the trouble condition, press and hold the seven key down until the beep. When the trouble condition has been corrected, press and, press and hold seven until it beeps and then press the hash key to clear the power LED trouble conditions. Some troubles will clear themselves, things like, for example, AC fail. <clears throat> so location 16 um, is again uh, enable, disable, so yes for enable and uh, no for disable. So sublocation one is AC fail trouble display. This trouble, condition mon this trouble condition monitors the AC power, the alarm uh, on. Try that again. This trouble condition monitors the AC that powers the alarm panel and will register a trouble condition after the time program in location 15. This will clear when the AC is restored. Okay, so sublocation two, reporting communication fail trouble display. This is if the panel tries to communicate and fails to communicate after trying the number of times in location 47. So sublocation three, that's for phone line trouble display. A trouble condition will be displayed when the telephone line goes down. So four is for siren tamper trouble display. This option looks for a load and when this load goes missing, a trouble is indicated. So your five is for low battery detection trouble display. The alarm system tests the battery every 30 minutes. If a trouble is encountered, a condition will be shown. So sublocation six is your auxiliary 12 volt trouble display. When there is a short or some, some sort of trouble that causes the 12 volt output to fail. So seven is your engineering reset trouble display. If this option is set in partition options in location 211 to 218 and the alarm is triggered, the alarm can only be armed again once the installer code has been entered. So eight is your box tamper trouble display. If the alarm control box is fitted with a switch that is connected to a tamper. <coughs> Sorry, give me a second. My apologies, had a bit of a cough there. Uh, Option nine is your peripheral tamper trouble display. If any peripherals tamper has been set, then a tamper will cause this option to be displayed. So your sublocation 10 is your 48 bus fail trouble display. This will display when the device at attached to the system via the bus fails to stop communicating. So 11 is your peripheral low battery, and sorry, peripheral low power or battery display. If an expander detects a low power on the 12 volt terminal, a trouble condition will be displayed. So option, uh, location, uh, sublocation 12 is your wireless battery low. When a wireless device battery needs to be replaced, the device will send a battery low signal and triggers a trouble if enabled. Okay, sub 13, which is your wireless supervision monitoring. Each wireless device will check in and if device does not, and if a device does not, the trouble will be triggered. Okay, so that's for each device, <clears throat> each wireless device will check in and if the device does not, if the device does not check in, then a trouble will be triggered for that, for that sub location if enabled. 
case application 14, wireless RF jam, if an unknown signal that can interfere with signals from the wireless uh, device is detected, a trouble will be triggered. So 15 is your wireless RSSI. RSSI is a signal strength measure, measurement, and if low, lower than 20%, a trouble will be logged. Okay, 16, zone tamper. If a zone tamper is monitored for the tamper and then a tamper signal is detected by the alarm, a trouble will be triggered. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, so continuation, continuation of our global settings, location 17 is for siren timeout. This is the time the siren will turn off after an alarm is registered. Location 18 is your siren delay. The siren can be delayed not to sound for a specific time after an alarm is registered. For the siren delay to take effect, location 14, sub, sub location 7 must be enabled. And location 32, auto test interval. This is the time between test signals that are sent back to the monitoring company. Every time an auto test is done, the event is automatically and sequentially numbered. The counter starts at zero and increments to 2.55. So to set those auto time intervals, you, um, option zero is every hour, one is every two hours, uh, two is every three hours, three every four hours, four every six hours, five every eight hours, six 12 every 12 hours, seven once a day, every day, um, eight is every two days, nine is every three days, 10 is every four days, uh, 11 is every five, 12, six, 13, seven, 14, eight, 15, 9, 16, 10, so that's every 10 days, 17, every 11, 18, every 12, 19, every 13, and 20, every 14 days. Okay, and well, lastly for the slide, location 33, which is your auto test time. This is the time of day that the test signal um, this is the time of day that the test signal set in location 32 must be transmitted. So this is the, so the 32 is your, your when your test signal is going to be set and uh, 33 is the time that it will be sent. Okay, our next option is our security options starting at our location 23, which is a user, installer, and maintenance code, number of digits. Uh, by default, all codes are made up of four digits. This location can change the number of digits that make up the code to six digits. <clears throat> location 198, download code. This code protects the system from unwanted external connections via the RDS Swift software. To connect successfully, you must have the installer code and the download code. The default is 999, uh, 9999, and the valid range is from 0001 to 9999. Okay, so location 199 is your maintenance code. The maintenance code is for this for a super user to be able to change some settings using the location method as an installer would. So just take note that on a, a maintenance code, no setting can be changed that would compromise communication with a security company. So you do have 
uh, admin rights, if you want to put it that way, but it is restricted. So the panel functions that can be edited in a maintenance mode are your siren time, your keypad lockout count, all daylight saving settings, all no zone activity auto arm settings, your siren delay, your keypad sleep delay, all partitions auto arm settings, and all no zone activity arm set, alarm settings. Our next option is our reporting codes. Indication 261 to two, uh, 375, the value of the reporting codes are entered for reporting formats other than the SIA and contact ID. For example, formats like your FBR two by four, you will go to installer code star, your location star, your sublocation star, and then your reporting code star. Once in the reporting code location, enter a two digit hexadecimal number. This number must also be programmed on the base station in your control room. So event reporting, when using contact ID and SIA formats, all event codes are programmed into the X-Series alarm system and only need to be enabled or disabled in location 501 to 588. The first eight options are to enable or disable the reporting. <clears throat> the second eight are to select which group of phone numbers to use. So programmable outputs. So you clear on this arm. This is for location 380. So clears onboard programmable outputs on this arm. Any outputs enabled in this location will be reset when the alarm system is disabled. This is for the not, uh, onboard outputs one to five. Location 381 to 386 is your clear zone expandable, expander programmable output on this arm. Any outputs enabled in this location will be reset when the alarm system is disabled. Location 381 is expander one, 382 is expander two, and so on. So location 387 to 388, clear output expander programmable outputs on this arm. Any outputs enabled in this location will be reset when the alarm system is disabled. Location 387 is for output expander one, location 388 is for output expander two, and so on. Okay, location 389, um, clear, keep, clear keypad programmable output on this arm. Any outputs enabled in this location will be reset when the alarm system is disabled. Okay, partition dependent events. There are just too many of these to go through all of these uh, partition dependent events. So we will focus on the most popular ones. There's a sublocation for each of the eight partitions. Uh, 390 is your closed programmable outputs. Enter the output and action to perform when the alarm is on uh, away armed. So let's have a look at an example of, um, of this to, to close a programmable output. So let's say we want uh, PGM to latch high, in other words, switch on when the panel partition is armed. So we'll go to obviously our hash double nine double nine star. We'll go to location 390. We enter the partition number in this case, which we want as one. Then the P PGM number, which is again one, and action, which is our latch high, which will be zero, zero. So on the keypad, we would then type hash double nine double nine star 390 star one star zero one zero zero. So zero one being the PGM and what you want the PGM to do. So zero zero. Okay, so location 391, uh, stay close programmable outputs. When the alarm is armed in a stay mode and someone is staying on the premises, internal zones are automatically bypassed. 392, open programmable output. 
Open means disarm from either away or stay armed. So let's have a look at the same as 390. Um, 392 is 390 is to close the programmable output and 392 is to open programmable output. So we'll go through an example there as well. So let's say we want PGM1 to latch, uh, latch low, so now that's switch off. When the panel is, um, when the panel's partition one is armed or disarmed. So then we'll go to your, obviously your programming. So hash double nine, double nine star, location 392 in this case, entire partition number, which in this case is going to be one. Then the PGM number, which is one and our action, which is latch. Zero, 01. So on the keypad, we would type in hash double nine double nine star three nine two star one star zero one zero one. So zero one for the PGM and zero one for our action, which is our latch high, which is zero one. Okay, location three ninety three. Um, cancel programmable outputs by disarming a partition. An output can be turned off. 397, zone tamper programmable output. If tamper has been enabled on the zone and the tamper switches on, the device is triggered. So 401, keypad panic, programmable output. When the panic is on, the keypad is, uh, is, is, the keypad is pressed. Huh? Sorry, when a panic on the keypad is pressed. <laughs> um, 402, Keypad fire programmable output when a fire button on the keypad is pressed. 403, keypad medical programmable output when a medical button on the keypad is pressed. Okay, 405, duress programmable output. A duress code can be programmed into the system to mimic a user code, but will send a duress panic signal to the control room. Okay, 407, burglary, burglary programmable output, triggered when the alarm is on and a zone is triggered. 408 is your panic programmable output. If any panic event is triggered, um, 409 is your fire programmable output. If any fire zone is triggered, 410, uh, temper zone programmed output. If a zone is said to be to be of a zone type temper. So if, if it's set to a temper zone, it'll be obviously trigger that programmable output. Zone triggered outputs. A zone can be set to trigger a dedicated output, either only when the, the set zone triggers an alarm condition, or if a set zone will, will always trigger the programmed output. This requires the output zone properties to be enabled in location 101 to 164, option seven. Remember if the zone is set to only trigger an output on an alarm condition, then it will only trigger the output when all conditions are met. For example, an instant zone will only trigger when a system is on, but a 24 hour zone is always active. Therefore, even if the system is unarmed and the zone is triggered, the output will trigger. Okay, location 415 to 422, which is your zone trigger outputs. There are eight sublocations for every, there are eight sublocations for every location. Each sublocation re represents a zone. So 415 is zones one to eight. 415 is zones one to eight. 418 is zones 25 to 32. 421 is 49 to 56. 416 is 9 to 16. I put those out of order on purpose just to keep you guys uh, you know, in tune. 419 is 33 to 40. 422 is 57 to 64. 417 is 17 to 24. And 420 is 41 to 48. So we'll show you a little bit of a practical example at the end of the slide 
Uh, so hang in there. I will show you exactly what, what we're going to do as a uh, done a little prep for you guys. Um, globally triggered outputs. These events do not depend on the partition, but are system related events. Each event can be programmed to activate a PGM output. So 423. Uh, so one is an AC file programmable output. By default, the system monitors the 16 volt AC and will trigger these options if there are any changes. So two is AC restore programmable output. So three is your low battery. <laughs> your three is your low battery programmable output. So the bat the battery is monitored constantly and will trigger these outputs if the battery power becomes too low or is restored. So four is your low battery restore programmable output. <coughs> so four to four. Um, four is your box tamper programmable output. The alarm panel has two, uh, uh, the alarm panel has a two pin connector that can be connected to a switch to monitor the door or the panel of uh, the box panel, the panel box. So dedicated pan panic programmable output, onboard dedicated panic connector is in, is next to the zone eight. So yeah, zone eight on your board, there's a dedicated panic that you can utilize. Okay, six is your communication fail programmable output. If the system cannot communicate and deliver an event via a phone after the phone number, after the number of trials programmed in location 47. Okay, so telephone line tamper programmable output. The telephone line voltage is monitored and if this changes, then the output will trigger. Okay, four, eight, uh, 425 is R, uh, one is RF jam. If a signal is detected that interferes with the receiver, a jam will be logged and an output can be triggered and reset when the jamming signal stops. So option three is for RF super, supervision fail. Uh, each device is set to send a signal either every 90 minutes or 12 hours to confirm if it is still available. If the system does not receive the signal, a, super, a supervision fail will be locked. So option four is your RF detector battery low. When a wireless device detects that its battery voltage is low, it will inform the system and the system can set the output to warn the occupants and restore when the battery is replaced. Okay, four to six. Uh, three is your fire sensor power programmable output. Fire sensors need to be reset when they have been triggered. This option allows the system to reset the device. So four is a dual reporting programmable output. When the system has been set to dual reporting and the second number is dialed, this option will trigger an output. So five AC fail on smart power supply programmable output. By default, your smart power supply monitors the 16 volt AC and will trigger these outputs if, if there are any changes. So six AC restore on a smart power supply programmable output. So seven is a low battery on a smart power supply programmable output. The battery is monitored constantly and will trigger these outputs if a battery power becomes too low or is restored. Okay, four to seven. One is for fuse fail on a smart power supply programmable output. By default, the smart power supplies monitors the fuse and will trigger these outputs if there are any changes. Two, fuse restore on a smart power supply programmable output. Okay, configuring pulse length. The pulse duration of each of the PGM outputs can change to the required time in minutes and seconds if needed. So location uh, four to eight, onboard output pulse length. Each of the five onboard outputs can be lengthened or shortened. Location 429 to 434, zone expander output pulse length. 
each of the six zone expanders has two outputs. <coughs> so location 435 to, to 436, um, output expander, output pulse length. Each of the, the two expanders have eight outputs. So location 437, keypad output pulse length. Each of the eight keypads have one output. Okay, so I'm just gonna follow this up with a video on the next slide. First, we are going to change the pulse time of PMG output five. Then we will program zone six to pulse output five. We are also going to make zone six trigger the output whenever it is violated and not only when it causes an alarm in zone properties. See how the LED turns on then off when zone six is violated. Hey, great stuff. Okay, still on programmable outputs. So we've got our scheduled outputs on times. The X series programmable output can be scheduled to turn on or off by time and day per output. It is our M. It is a oh goodness me. It is a however important that the time and date is set for this feature to work correctly, obviously. Okay, location 438, onboard output on time. So it's the on time. The location has five sublocations representing outputs one to five on the main system board. Location 439 to 444 is your zone expander output on time. This location has two sublocations representing the two outputs on each expander. Location 435 to 460, uh, 446, output expander output on time. Each location has eight sublocations representing the eight outputs on each expander. Location 447, keypad output on time. This location has eight sublocations <coughs> representing, representing the output on each keypad. So schedule output off times. So location 448 is the onboard output off time. This location has five sublocations representing outputs one to five on the main system board. Location 449 to 454 is your zone expander output off time. This location is two sublocations re representing the two outputs on each expander. Location 455 to 456 is your zone expander output of time. This location has eight sublocations representing eight outputs on each expander. Location 457 is your keypad output of time. This location has eight sublocations representing the outputs on each keypad. Okay, location 458 to 498, output on or off days. Each output can be scheduled to switch on or off on certain days of the week. So your on days is uh, one is Monday, two is Tuesday, three is Wednesday, four Thursday, five Friday, six Saturdays, seven Sundays, and eight is your disabled. So for your off days, nine 
then becomes Monday, 10, Tuesday, 11, Wednesday, 12, Thursday, 13, Friday, or oh, Friday the 13th, oh yeah. 14, Saturday, <laughs> 15, Sunday, and 16 is disabled. So x wave two outputs, uh, location 620, x wave two IO module programmable, outputs on this arm. So any outputs enabled in this location will, will be reset when the alarm system is disarmed. The IO module outputs are location 621 to 624, X-Wave 2 IO module outputs, pulse length. The pulse duration of each PGM output can change to the required time in minutes and seconds if needed. These locations, this, this, these locations have four sublocations representing four outputs learned to each of the X-Wave hubs. That's X wave two hub. Location 625 to 628, uh, X wave two IO module output on time. The X series programmable outputs can be scheduled to turn on or off by time and day per output. Remember, it is important that the time and date is set for these features to work correctly. This location has four sublocations representing the four outputs learned to each X Wave 2 hub. Location 629 to 644 is your X Wave 2 IO module output uh, on or off days. Each output can be scheduled to switch on or off on certain days of the week. So, okay, lastly, for the slide, location 645 to 648 which is your X-Wave 2 IO module output with off time. These locations have four sublocations representing four outputs learned to each X-Wave 2 hub. So to change gear, gears a little bit, we'll go to our user operations. <clears throat> Just run through those keys for you again. Uh, so one key is a quick away. By pressing this key until the exit beep begins, we'll away on the system without having to enter a user code. So the two key, which is your charm, this is to enter which zone are to beep the keypad when, uh, when they are violated. This will only happen when um, the system is disarmed. Okay, three key is your stay zones. To enable the zone, zones which are to be automatically bypassed when, the arm, when armed in stay mode. Okay. So four key is your buzz zones. To enter the zones which are to buzz the keypad if violated when the system is armed or in stay mode. Five key is your quick stay. This key, uh, this key will arm the system in stay mode and if any zones have been enabled, they will be bypassed automatically. That's your quick stay. Mm. Your sixth key is your stay and go. This will arm and stay, this will arm in stay mode, but all entry exit zones will work as if they are armed away, as if they are in the armed away mode. So your seventh key is your trouble view. If the power indicator is flashing, is flashing press, <laughs> press this key for three seconds and the zone indicator will show that the, tr the trouble condition, what the trouble condition is. The zero key is your alarm memory. If an activation of a system has taken place to see which zone or zones trigger, press and hold the key for three seconds. The panic key, the panic condition will be activated when this key is pressed for one second. Same with the medical key, the medical condition will be activated when this key is pressed for one second and a fire, and a fire key, a fire condition will be activated if this uh, button is pressed for one second.
Okay, so user codes, uh, option three, add a user code to a specific slot. A slot is a memory location for the, um, a memory slot is the memory, let me try that again. A slot is a memory location a user code is saved to. Slot one, user one, up to slot 128 for user 128. Okay, option four, delete a user code via slot number. If the original code is not known, but the user slot number is option four, allows deleting via slot numbers. Option five, view a user code slot number. If a user code is known, but you want, <coughs> if a user code is known, but you want to know which slot that code is in, this option will display the slot number once the original code is entered. Okay, option 13, user output. This is to allocate the output which the user code sets as an output trigger code in option 10 and must be, must be activated. Take a note there, the user code properties programmable output code must be enabled before this option will work. I'm just going to pop another video through for you guys. We are going to add two new user codes, 2222 and 3333. We are going to give user code 2222 permission for partition 2 only in option 11. Now we are going to give user code 3333 partition to trigger an output in option 10. And now we need to determine which output an action 3333 will trigger. See how 3333 Pulses output five. And here you see that double two double two cannot arm partition one. Great. So let's get through to our remotes. Almost done, guys. Got a, probably got another. 20 minutes to, not, not even probably 20 minutes, 20 minutes to half an hour, I guess. So we'll finish off with these last couple of slides. Uh, advanced remotes. So it's option 21, adding remotes. Um, so this is adding the remotes with an advanced method. We went through the basic method of adding the remotes, um, obviously in the X series basic training. So this is now to expand on that and do it via the advanced method. That's what, uh, the advanced method allows each button to be taught to a different user code. The button will act as if, the, as if that code has, entered, has been entered into the keypad. So all user codes must be added into the system before you start this. Okay, so press Press and hold your star key for three seconds. Enter your master code, followed by your star key. Enter the value of 21, uh, followed by the star key. 
enter the remote receiver ID that the transmitter will be taught to, followed by your star key. Now enter the user code or your user slot number, followed by the star key. Enter the manage button number, followed by the star key. So enter your management button number, followed by the star key. Uh, press star. Again, uh, when ready to teach the remote transmitter, then press the button on the transmi transmitter. Press the button on the, the remote transmitter that will belong to the management button number until it beeps. So we have a little bit of a video just showing you guys how to how to do that. So um, don't stress if you didn't catch that. We're going to do another little video just now. Okay, option 24, relay properties. The following properties can be set. One is secure. When power is lost in the relay resets in the opposite position, i.e. normally closed or reset in normally open. So panic, when a panic is triggered via a button or, a three, or the three second hold option, the relay will trigger. <coughs> Retrigger. This stops the relay from re-triggering for 20 seconds after an initial trigger. So pulse, the relay will trigger and then reset without any intervention. So option 25 is your relay pulse time. The default pulse is 1.5 seconds. When entering the time, enter the following format. Uh, minute, minute, second, second. So option 26 is your default to the remote receiver. This will put all the settings back to factory default. I'll just show you that video now. We will start by adding the whole remote to the panel using option 20. The receiver number is the ID of the remote receiver. Make sure you hold the remote button for a good few seconds when learning. Now we need to learn code 2222 to button 3 so that we can arm partition 2. Option 21 is used to learn a user code to a button and will overwrite whatever is previously set. The button will perform whatever action is set on that user code. We will also learn code 3333 to button 2, so we can trigger output 5. See how button 1 arms partition 1. Button 3 arms partition 2. And button 2 triggers output 5. Cool. I hope that uh, sort of gives you a little bit more insight as to those remotes. Okay, so we'll go to a couple more global options. So option 12, allow, um, allow installer code access. This option is to enable dis disable access to the user menu using the installer code. So one, installer code access. This option is enabled by default. 
Yeah, option 31 is language. The X series alarm panel firmware from version 2.3. Um, keypad version 2.02 .02, and app can display multiple languages. The languages can be selected are English, Afrikaans, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and Greek. Option 97 is manual auto test. If you want to test the, um, if you want to test the signal that are being transmitted via telephone, this option will force the X-Series alarm panel to transmit an auto test. The mode, the mode key must be held until a beep is heard, approximately three seconds. So manually set outputs. The X-Series outputs can be manually triggered on or off via the keypad. So if you hold your mode key down and go to three star and then output the output number you want to trigger and then star. A good way to test if the output is working. So if you manually want to check that your LEDs are working or that you have your LED connected to the right PGM, then this is where you'll obviously, this is the, the, the options that you'll be using. Changing between alphanumeric mode and LEDs simulation mode, this feature allows a quick look at all zones and what the states and, and what state they are in. So mode four, hold your mode, four, star, options, and then star. So one is al alphanumeric and two is uh, LED simulation. This is a great way to see all zones all at once. Okay, so X-Wave two. So option 14, is your X-Wave 2 bi-directional remote identification. You can check the ident identification of an X-Wave 2 bi-directional remote. You press and hold the star key for three seconds, enter the master code followed by the star key. You enter the value of the bi-directional remote identification followed by the star key. Now press the button on the remote. Okay, option 15 is the X-Wave 2 wireless device battery check. You can check the battery voltage on the X-Wave 2 devices via the keypad to determine if the batteries will require changing in the new future. The system will begin to notify you of low battery when the voltage reaches 2.5 volts. This can only be seen on an LCD keypad. By direction of remote transmitters, the X-Wave 2 hub has a remote receiver for all X-Wave 2 bi-directional remote transmitters built in. The receiver will communicate bi-directionally with learned remotes transmitted to give feedback on any instructions received from the remote transmitter. Each hub can be learned up to 16 bi-directional remotes. So defaulting of bi-directional remote transmitter, if the remote transmitter has, was learned to a different bi-directional installation, it must be defaulted before joining the new installation. So default procedure one, delete the remote from the previous learned hub, remove the battery from the unit, hold down the button one, insert the battery while holding button one and release button one. Default in procedure two, so delete the remote from the previous learned hub or, or be out of range of a previously learned hub, okay? Press and hold button one until the remote stops sending panic alerts, flashing the red LED for approximately 40 seconds. Okay, querying the X series, a bi-directional remote can query the alarm and feed feedback different information. Example, arm or disarm, current state profile, or arm was activated. To query, to get into the query status, press the query button then press the button that is allocated to the function that is being queried. The LED will indicate the status. So you'll need to have a look at table one, which is for your remote transmitter LED color meanings. So your remote transmitter LED, uh, the bi-directional remote has two-way communications with the X-Series alarm panel and can display different information by changing the color of the LED 
and flashing a number of times. So option 16 is adding a bidirectional remote. To add a bidirectional uh, X-wave remote transmitter to a uh, user code. So all user codes must be added into the system beforehand. So press and hold your star key for three seconds. Enter a master code followed by your star key. Enter the value of to add a bidirectional remote followed by your star key. Enter the X-Wave to hub ID that the remote, the remote will be taught to followed by your, smart, uh, your, by your star key. Um, now enter the user code or user slot followed by your star key. Press, press the star key when ready to teach the remote transmitter. Press the button on the bidirectional remote uh, bi-directional remote, and then press your star key to confirm. <coughs> so option 17, edit bidirectional remote buttons. Each button on a bidirectional remote can be assigned a different function. Each function requires a parameter value to indicate which partition or output to apply the function. The user code assigned to the remote must have the appropriate partition and user property permissions. Option 18 is deleting a bidirectional remote. To delete a bidirectional X-Wave to remote transmitters, uh, transmitter to a user code. <clears throat> uh, option 19 is the walk test. Walk test mode will, be, will put certain capable devices into a walk test mode from the X-Series keypad. Once in a walk test mode, the device will trigger continuously when an object has been detected and the LED will come on to indicate the detection. So to enter the device into a walk test mode, you enter your master code menu. So hold down your star key for three seconds. <coughs> Sorry. Enter your master code one, two, three, four, if it's still default, with, followed by a star. Uh, scroll using your panic your panic button, um, and then you scroll up to walk test menu and enter 19 star. Or you can just enter 19 star, sorry. So you can either use your panic key to scroll until you uh, find walk test in the menu, or you just type in 19 star, it'll take you to the same location. So enter the partition those devices you want to walk test. So for example, one star, Enter the number of minutes the walk test must stay activated. So that's uh, available from one to 15 minutes. The system will automatically exit walk test mode once the time expires. And guys, that brings us pretty much to the end of the training session. All the best. Thanks again. Cheers.